So where we left off is Genesis chapter 17. Genesis chapter 17. Um, the context I'll, I'll share right after I read the very opening of our passage because it really plays into the context to let us know where we exactly we left off. But we're in Genesis chapter 17, and I'm going to start in verse 1. I'm going to stop reading in verse 8 and like normal, just sort of talk about it, and then we'll continue on through the chapter. And so Genesis chapter 17, starting in verse 1. And now when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. And Abraham fell on his face, and God talked to him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you will be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. And I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make your nations will make nations of you, and kings will come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you through their generations for an everlasting covenant, to be God to you and your descendants after you. And I will give to you and to your descendants after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan. For an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. We'll stop right there. If you remember something, the last time we were together was, of course, Genesis chapter 16. And in Genesis chapter 16 is the lowest point of Abraham's life. Um, it's one of the darkest stories of Abraham's life. Uh, and even the father of faith falls. Everybody falls. And Abraham has made mistakes before, but Genesis chapter 16 is one that's going to haunt him for the rest of his life. And it's one that still haunts people today. As the descendants of Ishmael and the descendants of Isaac are literally killing each other in the Middle East every day. And so this decision happens in Genesis 16 that has ultimately changed the world and is going to play havoc on the rest of this book, the rest of our lives, but in particular Abraham's life. But one thing I need you to notice is, is that at the end of Genesis 16, it says Abraham was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to him. And then Genesis 17 opens up and says Abraham was 99 years old. You don't have to be a math scholar to know. That's 13 years. 13 years, God don't speak. God doesn't move. Nothing happens. And it's one of those things that you have to understand. And when you read Scripture, you, you sort of get to see a feeling of it. God, and, and I've been guilty of it. I, I sometimes picture Abraham as if, he had those burning bush moments all the time that him and God just communed constantly. And the reality is he did not. He talked to God the same way we talk to God through prayer. And how often do you hear audible voices from God and have multiple conversations with him through prayer? You don't. Neither did Abraham. Okay? It's not the same. So don't ever just put them on a different type of plane or a different level or on a pedestal and think they had multiple conversations. Abraham was a very blessed man. He was an incredible man of faith, and God did speak to him verbally and make appearances to him um, in a human form, as we'll see even later in the next chapter. But at this time, it's been 13 years. 13 years. He's been watching Ishmael grow up, and again, nothing has really happened. And then all of a sudden, God opens up with this, I am God Almighty. It's the first time you hear this name used, and it's a name not given to God, but it's a name God chose to use for himself, which is very important. It's not that he's sitting there uh, like, last chapter, we see Hagar that says it's a God who hears or a God who sees, and we, we give names to God that way, or like God is my shield or my fortress and all or this, God is my rock. 
This is a name God actually chooses for himself in this passage, and it's El Shaddai. Most of you have heard that at some point. That's the Hebrew word for God Almighty, okay? The all-powerful God, mighty God. That is what that name is, and that's the name he uses here because Abraham needs to know that God is all-powerful, that there's nothing he cannot do. He is in utter control. He is, as the theological term that we use, omnipotent. There is nothing he cannot do. He is possible of all things, and that is what Abraham needs to understand. There's nothing he can't, because what he is about to do with Abraham or promise Abraham is simply impossible. It can't happen, and that is that he's going to have a child. Not only that, he's going to be the father of a multiple of nations and kings are going to come from him. And we'll talk more about that in a second. But what he needs to know is, is that for 13 years, you have been watching Ishmael be raised up before you. The one child that you have had the ability to produce. And even though he is not the one, I'm now going to give you one. I'm going to do this because I am God Almighty. I am El Shaddai. I'm the one that has the ability to do it, and you're not going to be able to do it. It is going to be me. That's why he has waited so long. One of the commentaries that I read this week studying for this passage and getting ready to teach y'all, it said this, and I wrote it down so I can make sure that I quoted it correctly because any of you who have sat under me for a while have a tendency to put my spin on most quotes. This is what it says. Marcus Dodds is the one that wrote it. I am able to fulfill the awesome hopes that I've set before you of a people and a land. There is no need to let go of the promises because of your old age. There is no need to succumb to passive desperation. There is no need to scale down the promise to match your puny thoughts. No need to resort to fleshly expedience. No need to trying to fulfill the promise in your own second-rate way. Everything, all your life, all your future lies in this single statement, I am El Shaddai. I am. And that's what it means. Abraham has done everything in the world he could possibly do to make these promises fulfilled. And what God needs him to understand is you're only going to do because I'm going to do it through you. And the reason why I'm taking time to make this point on the simple fact of his name is simply this. Every one of us has been given promises by God. Every one of us has promises that he's going to use us for his kingdom and for his glory. But most of us, if we would simply admit it, we are guilty of doing everything in our own power and our own ability. And the reason I can prove it to you, you won't even teach a Sunday school class until what? You think you can do it. You won't go share the gospel with someone, which is what we were just praying about, until you can do it, until you feel confident enough to do it. You're not going to step out in faith. You're not actually going to go and do it knowing that he is El Shaddai, he is Almighty, and he is going to accomplish all these great works, all these promises through you. But he's not going to do it in your strength. It's his strength. It's completely different. And that's what changes everything. Y'all, we, there was one story I read, and, it, and it's so true. It's, a, it's an old pastor, old pastor sitting there, and he, he's had a wonderful, successful uh, life of ministry, and a young pastor comes up to him, and he's just wanting to learn how he was able to have such a healthy church, a growing church, and to plant so many churches. And so he comes up to him, and he says, man, I have done this. I, I, I've, I've got degrees. I, I've gone, and I, I've pa- pastored this church, and we've started this ministry. I started this ministry. I started this. And he goes through this long laundry list of all this stuff that he's done. And the old pastor just looked at him and says, man, that, that's really awesome that you've done all those things. I just imagine what you could do if God was doing it. And that's the truth. Most of us are simply guilty 
of only doing what we think we can do. But every person that is mentioned in this book is recorded in here because they did things not in their power, not in their ability, but in his. So we're the ones that put all the, the blocks around us. We put ourselves in these boxes, and we put God in a box. And the truth is, he is the El Shaddai. He is the Almighty. That's why we scheme and we do everything. That's why Genesis 16 even happened, that Sarah would suggest Hagar and Abram would go along with it. Because they're trying to do it in whose power? Theirs. Their ability. And we just continue to scheme and to do things our way and our own ability. And the reality is it was never ours to begin with. You hear me quote Ephesians chapter 2 constantly that we're saved by grace through faith and not of works, least any man should boast. But it go, always read that verse 10 that says, but we're created for his work that he did what? Prepared beforehand. Yo, I, I've given the illustration many times of me taking my child to a grocery or to Walmart or to some store like Target or a uh, mall or something to buy a Christmas present for Ashley. And at the end of the day, Maggie thinks she's the one that did it all. And the truth is, I'm the one that drove her there. I'm the one that paid her. Y'all remember the story? Uh, I helped her wrap the present and, and she put her name on it. And how happy she was that she was able to give her mama a Christmas present. And the reality is she didn't give her the Christmas present. I did. I did the work. But she got the credit. And the truth is, God is the one that wants to do the work in our life. He really does. And we're the happy kid that just goes along with it. We're supposed to be. But what would happen if my, my daughter says, oh, no, I'm just going to do it on my own. I don't need your help. Well, it's not going to be the same. And that's the truth. Most of us do it on our own. And that's what we get in Genesis chapter 16. And the truth is, most of us in our life, when it comes to faith, you are where you are in your faith because you're doing it in your own ability. You're only doing what you think you can do. The truth is, you could be doing so much more. And I'm telling you that as a man that never once thought I'd be doing what I'm doing right now. I sit here most Sunday mornings and I sit here on Wednesday afternoons thinking, what in God's green earth am I even going to tell you that you don't already know? Most of you are far smarter than me. You, you, you have far greater abilities than I do. And I think to myself, God, what in the world, what, what do you want me to do? And you know what he always tells me? Just get up and speak, stupid. Just get up and do it. It's never been you. And the truth is, it's never been you either. So quit hamstringing him. Quit telling him what you are and aren't going to do. And just do it and believe. That's all he's ever asked you to do is believe. Believe that he is the El Shaddai. Believe he is God Almighty that can move mountains and earth, that can do anything. And that's why D.L. Moody, I mention him constantly, he's, he's truly my hero when it comes to the faith. He has a saying that changed his life, and he, he, he tweaked it there at the end. I guess that's why I always tweak everybody's quotes too, because he did. He, he heard a sermon where a preacher stood up one day and said, the earth has yet to see a man fully and utterly devoted to Christ. To see what a man can do fully and utterly devoted to Christ. And Moody quotes that all the times through every book I've read on Moody. He always quoted that phrase. And he would always add on it. And I aim to be that man. Fully devoted. What can the world do with such a man? What can the world do with such a man and a woman here? If we would just full trust and just actually do it, just really believe and stop trying to do it in our own abilities. Many of us can get a little bit of success in our own abilities. And we're content with that. And the reality is God wants so much more. And we'll do exceedingly above anything that we can even imagine. 
you picture in your head something when you start and you think, oh, I think this could be great. But again, you put the limits on your abilities. And the truth is, he, he wants to do exceeding. Go beyond anything that you can even imagine. That's the whole point. And that's what he's saying here in this passage. He wants to exceed. He wants to go beyond. Something else you see here, the next, after he says, I am God Almighty, the El Shaddai, he refer, tells Abram to do this, walk before me and be blameless. All right, let me, let me cover this with you. The whole passage before, chapter, uh, not chapter 16, but in chapter 15, we talk about the covenant that God made. That's the same covenant he's talking about here. He's not giving a new covenant. He's just giving more ex explanation on the same covenant. Same covenant he did back in 15 where he walked through the carcasses of the animals, the sacrifices, all that good stuff. So we've already established the covenant and the fact that God's the one that did it. It's his covenant. That's why he'll say in here over 12 times, I will do this, I will do this. He ain't saying, Abram, you're going to have to do this. That's not what he's saying. But in this part right here, he says, walk before me and be blameless. Don't use that word blameless and think that Abram had to be perfect, okay? How many of you are perfect? I ask that question all the time. It's a rhetorical question because I know the truth and you know the truth. You're not perfect. You never will be perfect. And we know Abram ain't perfect. Do you know how we know Abram ain't perfect? Read the chapter before. All right. Uh, it, it, it's not. And in fact, we'll see him do something in this chapter that is not perfect. Abraham, while the father of our faith, is a really great father of faith because he wasn't always blameless. But here's what God is really asking him to do. Live like you are in covenant with me. Live like I have changed your life. Live like you do know me and not like everybody else. That's the point he's making here. He says you ought to live differently, which is the same command he gives every single Christian. It's the same command we all have. We are to live like he is our God. We are to be light. We are to be salt. We are to be different. And so walk before me. Again, what Noah was considered a, a righteous man and was always used that phrase, he what with God? He walked with God. Enoch was no more because he did what? He walked with God. And here Abraham is being called to do what? Walk with God. And when you walk with somebody, y'all, you're, you're with them. You're in companionship with them. And that's what he's asking Abraham to do. Be in companionship with me. Grow with me. You ain't going to be perfect. This whole thing ain't based on Abraham being perfect because he's not perfect. What it is, is, is what he's saying is you need to strive to be with me. Want to be with me. It's like Miss Iris just simply prayed. Give us a hunger and a thirst for your word and for your righteousness. Let me long to be like Christ. Let me strive to be that way. To have that desire. That's what he is asking him to do. And he says in verse 2, I will establish my covenant between me and you. Who's going to establish it? God. It's God doing it. Again, if Abram was the one that had to establish the covenant, would it work? No, it's why I talked about Sunday morning. Anything we add to salvation, that's where it's going to fail. Anything we think we're doing on our part, it's going to mess up. And Abraham, as great as a man of faith as he was, couldn't do it. Nobody can do it. And so God says, I'm going to establish my covenant with you. You're going to be a father in multitude of nations, all that wonderful stuff. And then he goes and he gives him a new name. Thank God, because I always am afraid I'm going to mess up and call him Abraham. And at the time, he ain't Abraham yet. But he is now. So now we can officially call him Abraham. And so the changing of a name, what is the changing of a name? For us, it really doesn't mean that much, not in our culture. Our culture names really, I mean, it, it's pretty comical. Uh, if you ever just want to get a good laugh, just Google recent funny names. And I, I mean, some of the names that parents give their kids is terrible, just absolutely terrible. Uh, and, and, but you don't understand that names in the old 
days, especially in this culture, really meant something. And it usually had something to do about them. Esau meant red. Why was that important? He had red hair. So they just said, your name's Esau. You got red hair. Jacob come out clutching supposedly the heel of Esau. They were twins. And guess what he was referred to? Jacob, what's it mean? Supplanter, grabber, heel grabber. He's coming out from behind. And so that's literally what his name's. I'm named after a character in the Bible, Ruth's dead husband. Do you know what Malin means? Weak and sickly. That he dead. That's why it means weak, sickly. The old boy was dead. And so names meant something. Abram means exalted father. The odds are he was named after his father, who probably was a very prominent man and exalted father. And so they named him exalted father, expecting him to be an exalted father. How many kids did Abraham have at this time? Just one. And then really, it's only been the last 13 years that he's had one. So exalted father, man, that was a tough name to carry around when you ain't a father. But imagine when God looks at him and says, all right, now I'm going to change your name to Abraham, which no longer means exalted father. It means father of multitudes. He's changed his name which is important because it's focusing on who Abraham is going to be. It's not just on who he was. You were the child of this father over here. I'm going to make you a father of multiple nations. I'm going to make you something different. Why? Because I'm El Shaddai. I'm the one that can do it. I'm the God Almighty that has this ability. And so he changes his name right there. Something else you need to know that when names are changed, it's also showing authority. When Adam had the responsibility to name creatures, he had authority over the creatures. And when God changes someone's name, not only is he changing the very essence of that human being to what they're going to be or their future, he's actually claiming authority over them as well. That's why Jacob was no longer the supplanter, but was named Israel after the wrestling match. We'll get to that later on in Genesis. Same with Simon when he came up to Jesus. Jesus changed his name to Peter, rock, on which he would build his church. And so everything happens. It shows authority. And so when God calls him Abraham, he's pointing to his future. He's also reminding him that he is going to be the father of multiple nations. And so again, you've got to remind yourself, at this point, God has said that every grain on the, or every sand or grain of sand on the ground or the dirt is how many descendants you're going to have. Every star in the sky is how many descendants you're going to have. And now every time somebody calls him by name, it reminds him how many descendants he's going to have. And so now every time he looks down, every time he looks up, and any time somebody calls his name, it reminds him. And of course, y'all, accepting this name had to be an act of faith. I mean, think about it. The old boy's 99 years old and he's got one child. 99 years old and got one child. And now he's got tons of servants. There are tons of people around him. We know he's got tons of servants. We saw the war that happened a couple chapters ago. There's 300 fighting age men in his house. And so there's lots of people with Abraham. And so don't you think it's odd that when his name was Abram and he just sort of walks outside and he said, oh, by the way, you can't call me Abram anymore. You call me Abraham, father of multiple nations. What do you think those people did? Yeah. They probably say, oh boy, has lost it. He's 99 years old. He's allowed to be a slipping a little bit. Okay? He, now all of a sudden he's got one child and it's multiple nations. All right? So you, it's an act of faith. And he accepts the name. And so he is now Abraham. But something more important is also mentioned. Again, God is giving, it's not a new covenant here. He's just making it a little bit more clear on exactly what God is going to do. Not only says you're going to be a father of multiple nations, he's already said that before, but he adds something different. He says kings will come from you. Now, this is the first time he mentions this. 
that kings are actually going to come from you. This would have been important to Abraham for many reasons, but probably most importantly this. Where is Abraham living at this time? Not only in the Holy Land, but in particular, what is he living in in the Holy Land? A tent. All right? He's just a sojourner. He doesn't own a single piece of property. And what God just said to him, not only are you going to be the father of multiple people, but kings are coming from you. Rulers are coming from you. That's what he's telling them, that the actual king is going to come from you. And we all know on this side of the New Testament that this is absolutely true. Number one, kings do come from him. You got Saul, you got David, and you got countless other kings uh, from the southern tribes and the northern tribes. But most importantly, the king of kings, Jesus Christ. Because that is how Matthew even opens up a son of Abraham. He makes sure to understand that the true king, the everlasting king, Lord of lords, does actually come from Abraham. So this promise is going to hold true in multiple different ways, but most importantly through Christ. He says he's going to make him exceedingly fruitful, full, all that good little stuff. And again, it says, I will establish my everlasting covenant with you. And we have the everlasting covenant through Christ and that possession, all of it. So all of this ultimately is pointing to Christ, and it's all ultimately pointing to the promise that we still have today. Every one of us has promised the promised land, okay? The holy land. You look in Revelation, there's a new city coming, a new Jerusalem, and there's going to be 12 gates, and the 12 gates are named after the 12 tribes, and that is where we're going to spend eternity with Christ. And it's for all the descendants of Abraham who come in via through faith in Jesus Christ. And so all of it is still a promise for us today that is going to be fulfilled. Just as he is almighty then and keeps his promise, so he is almighty and keeps his promises for us as well. So that's the first four or first eight verses right there. Something else I want to add to this is notice again the longevity and the waiting. Y'all, it's a long time. When the Bible says, wait on the Lord, he means it, okay? I, I would love to tell you that everything is going to happen fast. That is just simply not true. Uh, we live in a microwave world. We live in high-speed Internet. The idea of dial-up Internet is so foreign now that my kids laugh at us when me and my, and my wife talk about dial-up Internet. Our kids just shake their heads. Um, everything is so much faster today. And the truth is, God's timetable hasn't changed. When he says wait, he means wait. Patience. It's faith. It's something that he requires even back then. He still requires today. I don't care how fast we as humans get, God's timetable does not change. He operates on his time when he desires to do it. And so you need to understand that when Abraham left, he was in his 60s, and now he's in his 90s, and he still hadn't got a promise. Still hadn't had it come true. No, that's a long time. It's a long time to wait. But God is faithful. That's why he opens up saying, I am the El Shaddai. I am the God Almighty. He just wants to know, are you going to believe it? Are you truly going to believe it? Picking up with verse 9, going through verse 14. And then God said further to Abraham, Now as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. And you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. And every male among you who is eight days old shall be circumcised throughout your generations. A servant who is born in a house or who is bought with money for any foreigner who is not of your descendants. A servant who is born in your house or who is bought with your money shall surely be circumcised. Thus shall my covenant be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant." But an uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. All right. 
A lot to cover here in this little section, uh, simply because for a lot of people, it, it's just sort of confusing. But it's really not that confusing once you dive into what he's actually trying to say here. When God made covenants, he almost typically always gives a sign with the covenant. All right, we've already seen one in our study through Genesis. We had a covenant given to Noah that every time it would rain, something would appear, and that would be a sign that the earth would not flood again. Does anybody know what the sign of the Noah covenant was? Rainbow, all right? Let me explain something to you. Rainbows had probably existed prior to. It probably wasn't the first time they'd ever seen a bow, all right? Because there would have been moisture in the air, and you're aware that when there's moisture in the air and you're looking at sun, you get a what? Rainbow, okay? It doesn't necessarily have to happen during rain. You can get a rainbow on a nice, wonderful Alabama humid day, Okay? It is a possibility, and if you look at the way the Old Testament, when the way the earth was watered and all that, it would have been really humid, all right? And so the odds are the rainbow was already there. there there's other signs, though, as well, such as the Sinai Covenant. The Sinai Covenant we hadn't gotten to yet. It's in Exodus, but Moses is going to go, and he is going to get the Ten Commandments and the law, and God's going to give them a covenant there as well, and there's a sign, and I'll ask this question. I don't know if any of you know it, but does anybody know the sign of the Moses covenant that was given on Mount Sinai? Anybody know the sign? It's the Sabbath. The Sabbath had already been established. The Sabbath was established at creation. They already had a Sabbath. But the Sabbath was rest, and rest is going to become this key theme in particular to the law. Why would rest be important to the law? Anybody want to answer that one? It's pretty obvious because you work and you tell off to get to heaven. And so rest is something that's a big deal. You're going to have rest. And so the Sabbath was it. Everybody else in that culture worked from sun up to sundown every day of the week. There is no off days. Not the Jewish people. They didn't do nothing on the Sabbath because that's the sign. That's the sign that was given to them. So there's always a sign there. And when it comes to the Abraham covenant, there is a sign. And the sign given is circumcision. Everybody say, ouch. Okay? All right. Ouch. But here's something you need to know that a lot of people I, I, probably don't know. And the truth is, I didn't know until I went to school and started studying. Circumcision was not invented right here. This is not when circumcision got invented. It had already been around. It was in the culture long before this time. Multiple cultures already did it. The difference is what it was used for. Circumcision in the Middle East prior to the Abraham covenant was a rite of passage. It was something that was done to young men in some tribes in the Middle East, that when they would hit puberty, they would be circumcised. It was a rite of passage. And so the odds are, Abraham was probably already thinking about this. He's living in this new culture in the land of Canaan. It's something that's already been in the land of Canaan. We've learned through histor histor historical finds and digs and all that stuff. And he's thinking, all right, my son Ishmael is now what? Thirteen. And then as a Jewish person, which this is the founding father, 13 is the age. It is now the time they're about to become adult. He's probably thinking of this rite of passage. And God knows his heart and knows his mind. And the difference is what God does with it. He says, this is not just going to be a rite of passage that you're going to do at 13. No, no, no. Day eight. The day the child is eight years old, you're going to circumcise him. Because they're mine from the beginning. This is all going to be me. It's not that you all of a sudden have now come to this point of age and you're now going to be a part of my, my, uh, my degree or my covenant. They're always going to be. They're going to be in this regardless. It is the sign of the Abraham covenant, circumcision. Uh, but you need to also understand why this is such a big deal. I mean, think about it. And y'all, let's just be real. Y'all know me. I, I'm... I'm probably a lot different than most pastors you've ever had. I can be pretty blunt, 
all right i can and i don't i don't pull punches i just speak as i speak it's like the other sunday uh i i can be different and so believe it or not i'm going to say a word this may offend some of you but i'm sorry but i'm going to say it penis okay it is a english word you need to understand that there's a reason this covenant is done how how and we're all mature in here how does children happen again this is a conversation we had sunday i always well, I, I well i was eating lunch and you know um y'all have several how many children do you have now four all right when people would come up to her and say you know how that happens you know, and I've heard people say that. Do you know how that happens? And, of course, I, I'm a lot nice. I'm not as nice as she. I'm a little bit more blunt. And I always tell her when somebody asks you that question, you need to look at them dead in the eyes and say, I don't know how. How does it happen? <laughs> Explain this to me. I would love to know. And that's when I told her, I said, most of those people who are asking that question have never even said the word penis in their life. They're not going to be able to explain it to you. They've never said it. So there's the context of why I was pointing at you earlier. But anyway, understand, how does children happen? We all know. I, don't, I hope I don't have to give a biology lesson in here because it'll get me embarrassed even more than I already am. We can go to Song of Solomon later. All right? That's a wonderful book, by the way. And so anyway, we all know how it happens. But you got to understand the context. Y'all, context is key. Do you think God just pulled circumcision out of thin air and said, this is it. This is my sign. Heck no, he didn't. What happened in the previous chapter? Abraham did what? He had sex with Hagar to produce a child, which is Ishmael. And, of course, he wasn't circumcised at the time, but the whole act, everything, the circumcision is an act of repentance for Abraham. That's what this is. You need to understand that I told you you're going to have a child. And I'm going to give you a child. And because you weren't going to be patient and you weren't going to wait, you decided to do this in your own strength. Well, let me remind you something. Since this has never happened for you before, foreskin. Because now every time you use this, you're going to remember, I'm the giver of life. I'm the one in control. And if you were going to have this child of promise, it's going to be because I give you this child of promise, not something you do on your own. Do you all see now the connection? Because you need to understand, God did not just pull circumcision out of thin air and say, oh, I think this will be a great sign. No, trust me. If you're a man, this ain't a great sign. It, 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 get a rainbow or something, okay? circumcision was done because of what abraham did the chapter before he needed to understand that this is for repentance and you're going to be dependent utterly upon me for this child and every descendant you have notice his word of your household of of your descendants will bear this same thing because it's of my choice and my lineage that i'm going to establish not you, Abraham. That's the point. That's why he chose circumcision. And so if you've ever wondered why in the world circumcision, that's why. It's because of Hagar. That's why he chose that. It's a sign of repentance. Guess what circumcision also includes? Blood. Guess what all covenants have to have? Blood. Every one of them. And so it fit, and it fit perfectly for the context and the situation. And so that's why. And so now Abraham would be reminded of his covenant now. And what was the covenant? I'm going to make you a father of multiple nations. And the only way that's going to happen is through that member, and that member is now going to be forever changed. You got it? Good. Now we can move on from biology, and I won't feel near as embarrassed up here. 
but it's important. And the reason why it's important for me to tell you this, how many of you have ever even heard that before? Has a preacher ever explained to you why circumcision? But see, that's the thing. When I'm out at the gym talking to somebody or I'm out at the football field talking to somebody trying to share my faith, you know what they want to know? Why circumcision? You know, why? And you know what most Christians can't do? They can't explain it. Because a preacher ain't never, a preacher's scared to death to use the P word. And, and, and the truth is, y'all, we just need to be real about it. This is why this happened. It's because of what he did, his sin with Hagar, that this whole thing came about. God takes bad things and makes it into what? Good. That's what he does. He's really good at doing that. And so that's why circumcision is there. That's why he chose it. Because I promise you, Abraham was going to know. Abraham would never forget. And the reality is, circumcision for us as a Christians has changed. Okay? It has changed. It's, and the truth is, God was always wanting to do it this way to begin with. Y'all do realize the majority of the Old Testament is nothing but a symbolic thing of what was to come. Isaac was a child of promise, a miracle child, a miracle birth, and so was Jesus Christ. The son Isaac would be offered up, and so will his son, God's father, son, be offered up. And circumcision is the removal of the hard heart. That's what he's pointing to. And it wasn't just a New Testament thing. It was an Old Testament thing. The Old Testament saints knew this. They just forgot it along the way. And I'll get more into that in just a second as I continue our study. But to show you in the Old Testament, in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6, it says this, Moreover, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the hearts of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul so that you may live. It's not so much that circumcision it's this circumcision he's looking for he's wanting to cut the hardness off your heart he's wanting to make you into something new jeremiah said the same thing in jeremiah chapter 4 verse 4 circumcise yourselves to the lord and remove the foreskins of your heart men of judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Or else my wrath will spread like fire and burn with no one to quench it because of the evil of your deeds. He understood. Jeremiah's telling him, man, you may be circumcised downstairs, but I need your heart. Your heart is so far from me, so wicked, and I need to change this. This is the problem. And Paul understood this. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 4, verse 11, and he received the sign of the circumcision, the seal of righteousness of faith, which he had while uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all who believe without being circumcised, that righteousness might be accredited to them. It's not about the act of circumcision. Again, we were just talking about it this past week on Sunday morning in Acts chapter 15. What did all the, the Pharisees who had now been saved demand of the Gentiles? Anybody remember Sunday morning, do a preacher a favor and just let me know. Anybody remember Sunday morning sermon? It's okay. It's all right. It's all right. The truth is they wanted them to hold to the law, and in particular, circumcision. He wanted every single Gentile to be circumcised. And what did they decide in the great council in Acts 15? They ain't got to be circumcised. And that's what Paul's saying. When Abraham received the covenant, when Abraham received the promise, was he circumcised? No, he wasn't. Christians, the Gentiles, didn't have to be circumcised either because it's really about the heart. And to further explain that, he says this in Colossians chapter 2, 11 through 14. And in him you were also circumcised with a circumcision performed without hands and a removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. And when you were dead in your wrongdoings and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him. And having forgiven us all our wrongdoings, having canceled the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, was which was hostile to us, and he is taking it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. 
And so what Paul is saying there in Colossians is this. Y'all, it's always been a circumcision of the heart. It's what it's always been. That's what he wants. He wants you to have a changed life. And to show you that, what did he tell him right there in verse 1? Walk before me and be what? Blameless. Actually, be different. See, Paul will also make many arguments. In fact, Christ would make arguments because the Pharisees would come up to Jesus, if you remember in Mark's gospel, and say, well, we're children of Abraham. And Jesus said, man, God can raise the children of Abraham from these rocks. That ain't the point. You've missed it. You have missed the whole point. It's not about your circumcision. A lot of the Jews believe that just the fact that they got circumcised, they're automatically going to heaven. Because they were born into Abraham's family. And they were circumcised on the eighth day. They're automatically there. And the truth is, God said for a long time ago, no, no, no. You are to walk with me and be blameless. And y'all missed it. You're not walking with me anymore. He wants a circumcision of the heart. That's why Moses said it in Deuteronomy. That's why Jeremiah said it to him before the destruction of Jerusalem. Your hearts need to be circumcised. You're supposed to be walking with God. You're not walking with God. And how does this apply to us today? Well, right there in Colossians, he compares circumcision to the sign of the covenant with us today. What is the sign of the new covenant with us? Baptism. All right? baptism's the new sign that's what it just says there you were dead and buried with christ raised to newness of life it's the new one you, you you're now changed and different your hearts to be circumcised but do you know what uh, christians have failed and fallen into the same trap a lot of the jews fell into they think because they got what they're going to heaven y'all i get wet every day I get in a bathtub and a shower. And if I want, my wife can submerge me. She'd probably be happy to do so and hold me down. It's not the baptism that saves you. It wasn't the circumcision that saved them. It's their hearts. And I know a lot of Christians today that have gotten baptized, and man, that's all they're going to hold on to is that baptism. And let me tell you something, they're still living a wicked life. And you've missed the point. You are to walk blameless with him. Not, again, it's not perfection. But when you mess up, you need to repent. You need to walk with him and be with him. That's the point he's making. It's a circumcision of the heart. It's an essential sign that was given to him. And something that you need to see there at the end of that passage is where he says if they've not been circumcised, and again, he, he's not specifically talking about the member downstairs. He's talking about the heart. If you're not with me, then you're not going to be in heaven. All right? You're, you, you're going to be cast out. And this is pointing to one of those truths that a lot of people just simply don't like anymore, especially in our culture. How many ways is it to God? One. Well, what if you looked at God and said, man, I don't want to be circumcised. I hate it for you. That's not what he said. We don't have that option. And the truth is, we don't have the option when it comes to our hearts. We don't have the option of not giving it to him and being with him. I like what one commentator wrote that I read this week. Ian Duguid wrote this. Many people today approach God as if they were interviewing him for a job position. For the title, personal deity in my life. And if the man upstairs fits the job description being non-judgmental, accepting everything we accept and allows us to determine what is right and what is wrong, he gets the job and what a lucky God he is. But is that not true? Is that not the society we live in? And in fact, is that not the churches that we mostly see in America? That the God must be a God that believes what we believe and does what we believe. That foes, walks hand in hand with our culture and our world. And that is not the God of the Bible. It's never been him. It's his way. Y'all, one of my favorite stories, and it was one of the first sermons I ever preached as your pastor. If you remember, I started in the book of Joshua when I came here. 
The very first sermon I ever spoke was from the book of Joshua. And one of my favorite stories in the book of Joshua is when Joshua is getting ready to attack Jericho. And he sneaks across the Jordan. After they cross the Jordan River, Joshua sneaks up closer to Jericho to try to figure out how this ragtag group of misfits is going to take down this monstrous city that is walled like crazy. And if you remember, he's hiding out. And he is surveying the city, saying, what in the world I'm going to do and then boom the angel of the lord which is who we found out last week who's the angel of the lord jesus appears but this time he's in full armor sword drawn and joshua sees him and like everybody else gets scared to death and joshua is like all right do you remember the story are you with me are you against me and what did jesus say neither I ain't with you or against you. That ain't the right question. Son, you need to learn the answer to the right question. Are you with me? Y'all, if you have a God that is all about you and only believes in the things that you believe, you got the wrong God. The question isn't, is God on your side? The question is, are you on his side? Are you doing what he's told you to do? Not forcing him into your box to believe what you believe and act the way you want him to act. No, he's already revealed his character right here. He's already given his commandments right here. You don't get to change them. It's not how that happens. It's not how that works. It didn't work for Abraham either. It happens that way. It's just the way it is. It's his way or the highway, and our culture just doesn't like it. But it's always been that way. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and there is no other way. There is no option C. It's just the fact. Continuing on, verses 15 through 19. And then God said to Abraham, So as for Sarah, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarah, but Sarah shall be her name. And I will bless her, and indeed I will give you a son by her. Then I will bless her, and shall be a mother of nations. Kings of peoples will come from her. And then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, Will a child be born to a man 100 years old? And will Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? And Abram said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. But God said, No. But Sarah, your wife, will bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. God, there's so much I've got to cover in this little section right here. Number one, Sarah. Sarah has changed to Sarah. The reality is the name basically means the same thing. Uh, Sarah, Sarah means princess. Sarah means princess. The only thing that I have read that is even hidden to the difference is this, is that there are some scholars that believe Sarah means my princess. Okay? Like the parents are saying, this is our little princess, my princess. Maggie is my princess. And, um, and so it, the princess, and then, but Sarah means the princess, okay? Still means princess. Everybody agrees it's princess. It's just, what's the difference? And so here, it is God telling Abraham, Sarah is your princess, and she will bear a king. That's what princesses do. They bear kings. And that's what he's doing. And this is huge because up to this point, Sarah ain't been mentioned. Again, this is the same covenant he established with him a long time ago. He's just giving him a little bits and pieces. And y'all, that's how it works in our life. I wish God would tell me up front, hey, I'm going to do all this stuff with you. Will you follow me? He doesn't do that. 
He didn't do it with Abraham. He never told Abraham, Abraham, I'm going to give you a new land. I'm going to give you multiple nations. But FYI, the land you're going to, you're never really going to own it. You're going to buy a little cave and you're going to die in there. And your kids are going to suffer 400 years in slavery before they ever get to the land. And you're going to have to suffer through famines and other stuff. There's going to be a lot of people that want to kill you. Your son, your nephew Lot's going to try to betray you. Uh, and you're going to have to go rescue his little tail and all this good stuff. Do you think Abraham would have signed up for it? Probably not. That's why God only gives you what? Little pieces of information. Because he's got to grow you into it. I promise you, God never gave me all the stuff that he was going to want me to do in my life. He never looked at me and says, Brother Malin, I, I, he don't call me Brother Malin. <laughs> uh, he never looked at me and go, Malin, weak and sickly, listen to me. I'm going to move you to the panhandle only to move you to Cordova where you're going to experience some really crazy stuff. And then after a year, you're going to leave there brokenhearted and destitute and i'm going to put you right back into the panhandle in the middle of a swamp in the woods and i'm going to leave you there for five years and then i'm going to bring you up and i'm going to send you to decatur the same place you used to make fun of people for being river rats when you were in high school and then i'm going to ha let you hang out with a dude named todd all right he, he didn't he didn't do that he didn't get to say i'm going to let you throw hay bales with Rand. Or play softball and never hit a home run. He, he, he didn't tell me any of that. He just says, do you believe me? Then come follow me. That's all he ever told me. That's all he ever told him. So he gives him little bits and pieces. And here he finally says, it's going to be Sarah. And what he does is he laughs. Now, y'all, there's a ton of commentary on this. And the truth is, here's the the best truth I can give you. Abraham's laugh was not in utter disbelief. It wasn't because he doesn't get rebuked. The very next chapter you're going to see his wife Sarah laugh when she hears she's going to have a child and God rebukes her because it was in disbelief. But you cannot say, like I read some commentator said, oh, this was a laugh of excitement and joy. Ha <laughs> ha, oh my God, you're awesome. Mm, no, it wasn't that either. And do you know how I know that? Because he starts contemplating his body. And at 99, he's like, ain't going to happen just ain't gonna happen um and then he contemplates his wife ain't gonna happen and then he says oh that Ishmael may live before you you see what I'm saying and so it is that a, 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 a does that really sound like a dude that was absolutely believing no but it wasn't obvious disbelief because he doesn't get rebuked. And so Paul explains it for us. Paul, in Romans chapter 4, verses 18 to 21, says it this way. In hope against hope. I love that. In hope against hope he believed, so that he might become the father of many nations according to that which he had been spoken. So shall your descendants be. And without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated his own body, now as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. Yet, with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully assured that what God had promised, he was able to do so and perform. You know what he says there? He probably had some doubts. He contemplated his body. And at 100 years old, anybody here 100? No? Okay. Some of you are getting there, right? I, I didn't say you were close. I said you're getting there. We're all getting there. Don't read into my words. But if you were to contemplate your body at the age you're getting closer to 100, would you say, yeah, man, sign me up for a child. I got you. No. And so, 
what he's saying here is this. Abraham simply believed, and he performed. And again, we're all adults here. What does that mean? They procreated, okay? He's at 100, she 90. Here's the deal, and y'all listen to me. How many times do you think they have done that? It's a rhetorical question. Because the truth is, they've probably done it a lot. Just like many of you who have been married, you've done that a lot. But with Abraham and Sarah, it was different. Abraham and Sarah, in particular, ever since God gave him the promise, I wonder how many times he performed thinking tonight's the night. Tonight's the night the promise is going to happen. And then a year went by. And then another year went by. A decade goes by. And another decade goes by. To be 100 years old and have the faith to give it one more shot. One more try. Because God said he was El Shaddai. He could do it. And that's what he did. And so even that was an act of faith. That's what Paul's pointing to in Romans. All these times we've tried, all these times we've done this, and nothing's ever come of it. And he's asking me to do it again. You just keep going. It's an act of faith. And so he laughs. And it, Isaac's whole life is going to be surrounded by laughter, laughter of joy, laughter of doubt, and laughter of unbelief, as we'll see next week. Last thing I want you to see, and I'll close with this, is obedience. And so it says there, As for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I will bless him and make him faithful and will multiply him exceedingly. He shall become the father of twelve princes, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, from Sarah will bear you, or from whom Sarah will bear to you at this season next year so now god put a time limit on it when he finished take, talking to him god went up from abraham and then abraham took ishmael his son and all the servants who were born in his house and all who were brought with money and every male among the men of abraham's household were circumcised from the flesh of their foreskins in the very same day as god had said to him now, Abraham was 99 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And Ishmael, his son, was 13 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And the very same day Abraham was circumcised and Ishmael, his son, and all of, the, of his house, men of his household and who were born of his house or bought with money as a foreigner were circumcised with him. All right, end of the chapter, this, to obedience. Notice, when did they get circumcised? That day. He didn't wait. He did it. And I don't know about you, but y'all, I sometimes put myself into the Bible to try to catch the context. Can you imagine a 99-year-old man walking into your tent with a flint knife saying, I just talked to God? How do you think that's going to go? You signing up, Todd? <laughs> I'm just joking. And so, look, or am I? No, uh, but look, and so, I mean, I, I put myself in, I said, oh, my God, which tells me this. Abraham lived his faith out before these people. You ain't touching these guys with a flint knife unless you're living out what you believe. And that's why, who was the first person to get circumcised? That's it. If you want your kids to really be people of faith, guess what you got to do? You're number one. Don't expect your kids to love Jesus when you only half love Jesus. If serving him is only something you casually do, your kids are not going to do it just because you casually hope they do it or want them to do it. You've got to be number one. You've got to lead by example. And everybody else will follow if you will lead by example. Abraham did it to himself first. And that's how he was able to do the rest of them. Because He'd already done it. And if you expect people to follow you and your faith, you're going to have to lead by example. Something I, I, I want to say, notice there, and I, I hinted at it, God told him no. 
I'm going to talk more about Ishmael and God saying no to Ishmael when we get to the later chapters where this becomes again a problem. Remember, I told you this is something that's going to haunt Abraham for a long time. This is going to be heartbreaking for Abraham. This is going to cause Abraham to struggle deeply. Abraham always just wanted the best for Ishmael. How many children does he have at this point? Just one. One boy. And he wants everything for this one child. And what did God say? No. So understand this. God has the ability to tell you what? No. Contrary to what our culture may tell you, this book tells me God has the ability to tell me no, regardless of how much you want it, and we're all guilty of this. What was the thing that he did? That Ishmael was a product of sin. And when God tells you that you have done something wrong, and 13 years go by and they hadn't spoken, this is a repentance thing. Circumcision was a repentance thing. That you, you made this mistake, and I tell you this new covenant is now the sign is this circumcision to remind you of the sin that you've done. And he says, all that Ishmael lived before you. How many times has there been a sin in your life that you loved and you longed for, and you went out and you got it yourself, and you begged God to allow you to keep it in your life? Abraham is just as guilty as us. I said earlier that even in this chapter he messes up. There it is. He wanted God to keep the sin in his life. You're going to have to cut it loose. And in a couple chapters, that's exactly what's going to happen with Ishmael. You're going to have to cut it loose. No matter how much you covet it, no matter how many years you loved it, it has to be cut loose. But that's something we'll talk later on as we continue our study through Genesis. No time for questions. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for giving us an opportunity to come and to discuss this wonderful chapter tonight, to understand the sign of the covenant of the circumcision, how it came about, why it's there, and how most importantly it points to Jesus Christ, the King of kings, the eternal King, and the land that we're going to dwell with, with him, and it's about the circumcision of our hearts. Thank you, Father, for those that have been faithful enough to come here tonight to listen and to serve. And it's in Jesus' name I pray and ask these things. Amen. Thank you all.